this one. Okay, so as the very last lecture of the summer school, it's my honor to introduce Oscar Kamera. He's uh, the leader of our research group and the person I work <laughs> close together <laughs> with. <laughs> and while I'm working more clinical, he's much more into the simulation part. And so he's currently doing some very, very interesting work on looking at chicken wings and cacti and wind socks and things like that. So, Oscar, please. Thank you, Bart. Um, and thank you, the organizers, for inviting me to talk again uh, this year. I guess that putting me the last one is because they know I'm a clown, a stupid clown, uh, and I won't put a lot of equations and just colorful uh, movies and, and pictures. So thank you again, organizers. Um, so just following this, uh, well, I challenge just to put uh, a bit of a weird title, like chicken wings, cactus, windsocks, and cauliflowers in cardiology. So that's really a weird question. I mean, some of you for sure already know what is this about. But some, maybe you are in the position as Aurelio. When Aurelio organizing the talks, etc., he asked me about the title. I sent him this, and then uh, he was like, uh, sorry, uh, pregunta tonta, but is one of your jokes or, or, or is this serious? Um, so it's serious. Uh, so, well, I mean, and I sent him, I sent him the abstract uh, uh, a bit later and maybe he understood a bit what was going on. Um, the thing is, last year uh, I needed to talk about uh, electrophysiological modeling. I was super happy about it also. <laughs> it was thanks to Bart. And we had a, a past conversation. And then uh, after uh, the, the VPH, the first VPH summer school, we got another conversation if it works. So Bart was very happy, was very successful, the first edition. I was barely just remembering the beer tasting and that I needed to give a one hour talk on EP modeling, uh, forced by him. Uh, and then, uh, well, he was telling that this year will be again a new summer school and on flow. And I was thinking about Carlos and Andy with their flow thing, this, uh, nothing related to work. And Bart asked me, can you give a talk? And I was like, come on, Bart. I mean, I didn't get the ERC grant, the consolidator grant, because I wasn't an expert on flow and I've yet stock. So, and then uh, Bart is asking me to talk about flow. Uh, and he was saying, like, well, but you can talk about chicken wings. And, and I said, okay, we have the beer testing and now we talk about chicken wings. So the gastronomy summer school in Barcelona. But then he convinced me saying that I could escape from my paternity leave for several hours. So then I accepted immediately. Uh, <laughs> And that's why I'm here. Um, but again, I mean, my relation with Navier Stokes, these two guys, French and UK guys, I mean, has not been very intense over the years. I mean, when I started doing a bit of research, I was more on image processing, 
uh, and of oncological images or modeling of Alzheimer's disease, nothing related really with uh, flow. Then when I arrived to UPF, I switched a bit to, to the heart uh, through all the years of my Ramonica Hall Fellowship and, and then being an associate professor uh, in our group, Fisense, doing a lot of uh, personalized cardiac modeling, VPH, and more on electrophysiology and a bit of mechanics, but also mainly um, just going for data processing and, and integration. And I mean, being in a large group, in large groups of researchers around cardiovascular applications, obviously I was collaborating in some flow related works uh, like these two ones that I will briefly explain, explain now. So the first one was with Simone uh, Balocco, uh, a postdoc that was uh, at the moment at CISTIP, where we tried to estimate the mechanical properties of cerebral aneurysms uh, from imaging. So we embedded uh, or we developed a whole uh, data simulation framework where uh, in the biomechanical part, we were using uh, FSI to impose some uh, constraints on the simulation, on the structural simulation. So we had some simple simulations, flow simulations on with console, console uh, and some flow, um, flow results, flow patterns in some cerebral aneurysm, but not more than that. Um, then, oops, uh, here, there is something missing, okay. Uh, I haven't put it here. Well, th there was another thing um, with uh, blood flow in the left ventricle that I collaborate with Ali Pashai, another uh, postdoc that was around, but I was mainly working on how to compare these fluid simulations in the left ventricle with uh, phase contrast MRI uh, data in very few cases. So then uh, in 2015, uh, we were starting to think, okay, that this should apply to this ERC consolidator grant. And, and then, I mean, my background really, I was working, I work on image processing, on modeling, on neurology and cardiology. So one good uh, point uh, was to go towards an application and methodologies combining and integrating the neurological and the cardiological part. Uh, both in application and in, in the methodological side. Because there are some uh, medical problems where really affect both the brain and the heart, and it would be very interesting to have a more systemic and holistic approach towards this, to study these uh, diseases. So um, two examples came uh, to our minds during the brainstorming. And one uh, was just talking or thinking about old people and it was the relation between a stroke and atrial fibrillation, something that is well known, very well known. And that's why this was not innovative enough, uh, not high risk, high gain enough for an ERC. So then we went to the second idea, uh, more dealing with young ones. And it was just to study the influence of cardiac abnormalities in brain development. So as I was saying, uh, nowadays in, in hospitals, really in, in most of uh, medical problems, uh, they go to the heart wing or the brain wing uh, or the neuro wing. And there is a lack of this kind of more systems medicine approach that is improving. Uh, so that's why this was the, the, the title of the project, the heart and brain axis, and just how to link these problems, uh, the cardiovascular level, Towards, uh, towards the brain development. So we thought uh, about the whole, uh, we developed a whole uh, idea about to, to work on data from intrauterine growth restriction uh, cases where it has been already proven that they have cardiovascular remodeling and they have some strange changes in the brain development that they are not well explained with the current theories of mechanical uh, brain development. So the idea was just to prove that uh, the component of the hemodynamic and vascular changes was missing uh, in, this, in this equation. So we, we developed, obviously, it, it involved a lot of different data, human, experimental, data processing at the different levels, multi-scale, and also coupling uh, mechanical power with uh, LAM models and with uh, flow uh, related uh, simulations. Well, 
And luckily, uh, the, the first year, they liked a lot of the idea, the reviewers. I was invited to Brussels, and after an intense uh, session, uh, and the 12 reviewers decided that uh, they weren't going to fund the, the project in the end. The following year, we improved a lot the project, and the reviewers thought that it was a very bad idea, the same project. So, well, I mean, this project hasn't started yet, but it will. So if you have uh, any ideas or funding just to uh, <laughs> contribute, uh, just very happy. Uh, but we'll, we'll start this uh, quite soon. So um, we say, OK, well, let's go for uh, the second idea, the relation between a stroke and atrial fibrillation. So here we can see how, uh, well, it was very quick, but uh, this relation that is very well known is when you have atrial fibrillation, that is the abnormal uh, rhythm in the heart, so the, the blood can uh, clot in particular in, in the atria and then go up and end up in the vasculature of the brain and then induce uh, a stroke. Uh, so this is quite critical and it's well known, but the tools and uh, the knowledge uh, in here, we'll see during the presentation that there are a lot of room for improvement and a lot of questions uh, to be solved uh, yet. So um, in particular, so, some clinical data, it's just uh, around one third, around one third or 25% one fourth of strokes, overall strokes and volume strokes are related to atrial fibrillation. So it's quite uh, massive. So as I was saying, uh, in the atria, due to blood abnormalities, the rhythm of the atria, some thrombus are, um, are created and then can go up uh, to, to, to the brain. And something quite interesting is just that this thrombus formation is not very well known. Why it happens when it happens. Uh, it's a very difficult problem to, to, to study also. Um, there are some uh, hypotheses in terms of uh, the characteristics or of the properties of the endothelial wall, how they get degenerated, the relation between the velocity, the flow velocity, the blood flow velocity, how it's related to the uh, thrombus formation. And one very interesting uh, uh, number is that 90% of all the stroke related thrombi are uh, formed in the left atrial appendage that not a lot of people uh, uh, know. In fact, there are some papers from the 2000s say that this is the most lethal appendage we have in the body. Um, so this is uh, some pictures from Damian, Professor Damian Sanchez Quintana, collaborator and good friend in Extremadura, one of the most well-known anatomists of the heart in Europe, um, that he has a lot of uh, post-mortem uh, specimens, and here are some of them. So this is the left, uh, atrial appendage open uh, inside, just a close, well, attached to the um, to the left atria. Here is from outside. This is the orifice, and we can see it here in another different view. A view here, the left ventricle. So it's a very complex structure, and in fact, it's involved in several pathologies like atrial fibrillation, uh, and it's not very well known why it's there. And this is quite shocking. I mean, because after all the knowledge we have in anatomy, etc., nobody is completely sure why in the hell evolution left this appendix there. Um, there are some hypotheses, obviously, like a possible uh, decompression chamber role when uh, in the atrium there are high pressures, like in left ventricle systole or in atrial fibrillation, but this is yet to be proven and demonstrated. Uh, also, some a very interesting uh, characteristic of the left atrial appendage is that they are very different in people. So uh, there is a high interpatient uh, anatomical variability. You can have different lengths, different number of lobes. Here, just some numbers. This is the different number of lobes, orifice dimensions, the overall shape, and we don't know why. Why evolution left? this appendage there, and they allowed also to have a lot of different shapes. So this is a question uh, yet to be, to be answered. So that's very interesting. Um, 
uh, since long ago, there were some people trying to study this, uh, this, this uh, structure, but it wasn't very easy to get, to get data. Uh, anatomist, uh, there were some studies already in the late uh, 90s, uh, just from autopsy specimens, no imaging, no medical imaging there, but it's very funny because they look like the pioneers of 3D printing. Huh? They were using these molds of uh, resin, synthetic resin, to just build this kind of molds and then measure these molds. Uh, so they, you, you can see that there is a, a large range of volumes, of orifice diameters, of lengths in all this population. Also, they saw, uh, it's a very difficult uh, structure uh, to measure in an objective way. How you measure the length uh, in here, in a very curved uh, structure, where do you measure the width of, of this structure is not, is not obvious. And also, they, they found out that the diameters were increasing with age, also quite interesting. Um, and then, some people with the advent of medical imaging, uh, they were starting to look uh, the geometry or the anatomy or, or the shape of this left afterall appendage <coughs> with uh, more uh, detail, and then they started to use whatever name to describe these anatomies. So in here, this group, they started to call these uh, left lateral appendages like having a horseshoe form or a hand finger or fan or wing, hook, wedge, swan, depending on the location and orientation of the left lateral appendage tip, the apex, the, the distal part. Um, and then they also found out that uh, some left lateral appendages with a particular shape were more prone to have thrombus. So that was quite interesting. So thrombus formation was related in some way to the shape of the left lateral appendage. And then here we discover why we talk about chicken wings and whatever. Because uh, in some more recent papers, they have started using uh, these kind of categories to uh, define the shapes of uh, some left lateral appendages and the clinical community they like. They like it a lot, people working on this, and then now everyone is using this kind of classification. Uh, this classification is based on looking at the lobes. If you have a, a large or a dominant lobe, uh, depends also in the number of bands and the number of secondary lobes, um, on the angles between the main lobe, the ostium, and the, the, the tip of the, um, of the apex, so then, well, you can have some cactus in here where you have secondary lobes, you can have a chicken wing that is quite smooth, is quite long, is quite big, and not a lot of secondary lobe. You can have this windsock that it has a variant, it's a more complex, and the more complex one, they call it cauliflower, for whatever reason, don't ask me why. Um, so I hope that now Aurelio and the likes of Aurelio know a bit more about these cauliflowers in cardiology. Um, but this is how they define uh, or they classify the shape of, um, of left lateral appendage nowadays. Uh, I guess you can see that it's not a very rigorous and objective uh, way of classifying shapes. Uh, and we'll see that later. Also, very important, uh, not just shape, is flow uh, in order to study the relation with thrombus formation. And uh, in fact, some papers uh, have found uh, some link between low velocities and low, low blood flow velocities in the left lateral appendage, link with a high risk of a stroke or even the presence of, of thrombus. Um, these uh, measurements are taken basically from transesophageal echocardiography. Just measure at one point in the ostium of the left lateral appendage. Um, also, some they found that the a decrease ve velocity, decreased velocities in the atria are also related to thrombus formation. And also, very interestingly, as I was saying before, some uh, shapes like non-chicken wing morphologies, they are linked 
to be safe in terms of thrombus formation. So if you have a chicken wing, um, uh, if you have a chicken wing, it's better for you because you won't have, uh, you will have less probability to have uh, a thrombus in there. Um, okay, and also some people, they, they found out that the number of lobes are important or related to thrombus formation. So what it happens when a patient has a high risk of a stroke? So you have two options, the eternal battle between pharma companies and device companies. Obviously, these guys, the drug people, are the winners almost always because it's the first option. And in this case, it's anticoagulants. Uh, the problem, like warfarin or the novel oral anticoagulants, that they look like more performant. Uh, the problem is that 20% of patients, because of bleeding uh, risk, they have contraindications to these oral anticoagulants. But also, I mean, this means that these people, they need to take, to take a pill for life, every day of their life. So the pharma companies are quite happy about it, but people just forget or they don't want to take pills anymore. So a lot of these uh, anticoagulant process are not followed and then originate some problems. And some years ago, they appear these new devices, around 15 or a bit more years ago, appeared these devices, the left atrial appendage occluder devices, as an alternative uh, to drugs for uh, people with risk of a stroke. So uh, they obtain kind of very, very good results in some registries, in some clinical trials. Some of them are, have already been approved by the FDA, like the Watchmen. Um, and there is a whole community working around these, these devices and several companies. And it's, it's getting more and more uh, market because they are seen as an alternative not for patients, not just the ones that have contraindications to oral anticoagulants, but also uh, as an alternative. Uh, so the first one were like this one, like this that was called Plato, uh, very simple. That is not anymore in the market. And then this is the Watchman, one of the most uh, used. And this is the two from Boston Scientific. And these are two versions of the Amplatzer, the St. Jude one also very, very much used. And the idea is just to put in here uh, this left atrial appendage to occlude, uh, to occlude it. And then just thrombus cannot be formed anymore in there. It's just really to occlude. And, and, and to, to cover the left atrial appendage. What it happens in the long term, no one knows. No one knows. There are no studies, long term and uh, longitudinal follow up studies uh, for these devices. So now they are becoming to appear some studies, the five year follow up for the first one or some of the first ones presented. So we don't know. And this is yet another question to answer what it happens in terms of long term. You are covering one part of uh, your atria and uh, yeah, probably there will be some consequences. Uh, some anatomists, they started just to look uh, carefully at some of the orifice dimensions in order to better know which devices were better to be implanted because I haven't mentioned that these devices come in uh, different shapes because left arterial appendix have different shapes in every patient. And this is the most important decision clinicians need to take when implanting this device, is the size of, of the uh, device. Because it needs to be uh, small enough to fit, but large enough that it doesn't embolize, it doesn't get out once it's introduced. And this is the, the clinical question, the clinical decision about these devices besides using one from one company or another. This sometimes is related to more to other, other things. Um, okay, uh, and then obviously you cannot have the post-mortem uh, heart in order to measure. Now uh, what they are doing is just use imaging, uh, imaging techniques, and they use several ones. Uh, basically they use X-ray and uh, TEE echo, transesophageal echo, uh, also during the intervention, they do it be before the intervention for planning and also during the intervention to check. And in some, uh, in some uh, clinical centers, they are starting to, to have 
also some CTs in order to have uh, high resolution uh, information of the anatomy. But most of them, they are just using uh, these two. And the problem is that they get contradictory information. Uh, everyone working with X-ray or uh, echo, they know that they are very noisy type of medical images. And what they do is just they do some measurements and then based on these measurements, they decide the size of the device to be implanted. So let me see if it works uh, on the web. Um, just to show you, um, on the web you have some live cases. This is Professor Horst uh, Sieber from Frankfurt. Uh, I will put the boys. Uh, I, I went in November to one workshop where 300, the most important uh, people and clinicians working on this type of devices worldwide were there. They meet several times per year and they do live cases. And this is quite a spectacular. The guy did in one day, I don't know, seven or eight uh, of these interventions live uh, and with a mic micro and they're just playing in the procedure. Uh, and it was quite funny. So they present the case, whatever. And the, the, the guy was having help from other clinicians worldwide that were helping on the intervention. And what it was funny, at least to me also, was that the uh, clinical decision was made by all audience. So, I mean, this patient was treated by 300 clinicians, the world experts on this. So probably he wasn't unhappy about it. And they were discussing, well, well would you implant a 27 millimeter watchman? Or, and people were voting, okay, let's go there. So it, it, was, it was quite surprising. Um, some clinicians told me that in order to be able to operate and talk and do a presentation at the same time, you need to get used because it can be quite messy. So you can see that they check uh, also the orifice of the lymphatic appendage with echo, 3D echo also. Uh, this is an echocardiographer from UK that was there just helping. Uh, he was in the conference. Uh, and you see, this is the appendage. Huh? If you are not an expert or you are not used to this, it's challenging, huh? and, and it's moving, also, obviously, it's moving. So they take the measures, uh, and, and this is a 2D uh, view of the, 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 the probe, the, the 3D probe uh, of the echo probe that is moving also. So take measurements, taking measurements here is not obvious, and is well, it can be more objective. They also check flow with Doppler, obviously, and let's advance, so people were discussing there. Is there? Yeah. yeah. So you can see actually there isn't much low beyond that point. So they are talking so about the number of lobes, where they will implant, just, just what they call the landing here. zone, uh, how deep they will implant the device or not. And they were just low, discussing, low. laughing, and so they were having a lot of fun. Um, and, and, and to get the right views at the echo, just to get the proper measurements is not obvious at all. So there is a lot of room for improvement in terms of imaging. And then you come to this, uh, the magical X-ray that only understand clinicians because normal people don't see anything in here but gray shades. Uh, but they use this uh, just to guide the wires. They introduce uh, uh, and they go transeptal through the atrium so they, they make a hole in the in, in the, uh, septal atrium just to reach the left atria, and uh, just let me show you. So this is the wires that obviously is quite clear that it's already in the left atria. <laughs> and then they take some measurements, super robust, based on these uh, shades of gray or whatever. Uh, yeah, obviously 25, 22 millimeters. 22, huh? not 21. <laughs> And then, and then they say, oh, it's a pity that it's a bit inconsistent with what we measure in the echo. Oh, what a surprise. Uh, and then they do, okay, in echo we see 23, in x-ray we see 27, let's put a 29. Come on, guys. <laughs> and this is how they decide the size, um, really. And, and what well, is working quite well, I mean, it's 90 5% of the devices are well implanted according to their criteria. So 
Well, I mean, why do you want to complicate things? Um, but it would be interesting at least. So this is, the, I'm not going to go through all the implantation, but here the device that is magical devices. Huh? I mean, in terms of material properties is something that you put into a catheter and then expands there. It just to me is a bit magical how, how this material uh, works. And then this is inflated and, and it covers what it needs to cover. And this is the implant being already put in the lefatral appendix, they, they do a bit of what, what they call is tack or tick tack, whatever, just to see if they are the, the device is not going to get out easily. One is implanted, and then they, they put some contrast to check if um, there is more flow or not uh, entering the lefatral appendage. Let's see if I can get some of the. Well, you see, this is kind of one of the umbrellas of the device that it's already put in there. And they, they do more measurements just to check if, if everything, if you can see more or less the flow doesn't enter the left atrial appendage anymore because it's covered, okay? And then they do whatever, more echo, and you see that the left atrial appendage cannot be seen almost anymore. This is the device and it's covered, okay? So this is how the procedure is, uh, and this is one of the devices, okay? Uh, oops. Come back. So, I mean, being an engineer and a computational guy, I think is quite interesting because there are a lot of interesting things to do in here. Um, one of, of the things is just improving the imaging. So there are new imaging modalities like this for the flow MR and some papers already showing that you can have uh, blood flow, uh, not just with 3D echo, but with 4D uh, MR, in order to uh, study blood flow in there in 4D, proper 4D, with ecstasis maps, etc. Also modeling, I mean CFD modeling, uh, that's quite interesting. Uh, and there are very, very few attempts of CFD because it's very difficult to get proper geometries of this lefatral appendage. And the papers nowadays is just on, done on one, two cases, or even synthetic and no link between hemodynamics and, and, and anatomy. Uh, so when you see that, uh, in, uh, as I was saying, uh, I was lucky enough to, to be part of a very large group with a lot of talented PhD students working, at least three or four of them, on cerebral aneurysm. It was part of a big European project called Aneurysm. And there were people working on uh, simulations, on CFD simulations, on device simulations, on image processing of cerebral aneurysm. And when you see the pipeline of uh, the computational pipeline for cerebral aneurysm, and you see what is needed for left appendage, it's exactly the same. It's exactly the same. So that was quite, quite useful to realize. Also, I got involved with the hemodynamic unit at hospital clinic because of some 3D printing projects, doing some funny thing uh, with, uh, for devices or, or systems for uh, electrophysiologist training or for TAVI planning. So all this together uh, just rise into Compilao. That is uh, my current national project for three years, uh, where the main objective is just to develop uh, computational tools to study the 3D morphology of the left atal appendage and the hemodynamics before and after this type of uh, LAO interventions. And it's very similar to cerebral aneurysm. Things that we want to try is just to find ways to build statistical analysis, to relate shape with hemodynamic parameters. Uh, how this shape changes uh, hemodynamics, what is the role in the whole cardiovascular system of the left atrial appendage, what happens when you close, uh, when you occlude the left atrial appendage, which parameters are the more important related to thrombus formation. All these are not answered. Um, and the jackpot is like, can we have a model to predict if a patient needs anticoagulants or just go directly with a kind of device. I mean, if you get that, just you will have a lot of funding from uh, pharma companies. Um, and then, I mean, just 
I mean, this is just more specific objectives. I won't go into detail, but it involves data processing, uh, kind of simulations. Also, we are going to use post-mortem data and 3D printing to generate ground truth data to validate the simulations. Everything will be open access for everyone to play with and, and try to translate some of these tools uh, in the clinic. Uh, so I'm going to show you a bit of the preliminary results we have. I mean, it's a collaboration with the hospital clinic, the hemodynamic unit, and some people in, in Belgium, some uh, uh, cardiologists there. Quite interesting because uh, in Barcelona they use the Amplatzer device and in Belgium they use the Watchman. So basically, typical uh, acquisition studies with TE and, and 2D X-ray, but also in Belgium we have 3D angiography data that's quite useful to obtain uh, 3D data and the geometries. And, and also we'll play with post-mortem data from Sanchez Quintana and, uh, and Andrew Cook uh, in, in London. Uh, what else? Yeah, I mean, this is just the acquisition protocol, I won't go. Also, we, we are in contact with Materialize, the big 3D printing company, just for this development of 3D uh, models uh, and then connect them to a pump in order to generate ground truth uh, data. Also with people like Hernan and Mathieu in Philips, uh, just on this side of uh, validation of flow simulations. And this is some of the data we, we start to have, uh, around 40 uh, geometries, some more complex in terms of having pressure information also before and after the intervention, some uh, with good and complete clinical studies, other just uh, regular uh, atrial uh, fibrillation cases, and we are starting to play with it. So these are some uh, of these uh, left atrial appendage we have in our database, I mean, just challenging, it's just challenging. All of these are left atrial appendages. Uh, we had some undergraduate students fighting uh, with them, trying to follow the standard criteria to separate and to classify them into this uh, kind of cactus, chicken wing, etc. So we have uh, observer dependent classification of this. And to, uh, but well, it's okay, having checked by clinicians and it looks okay. Um, because one day it can look a chicken wing and, and the following day for the same person can look a whatever, huh? a cauliflower. Uh, we have started to do simple measurements on, on these cases like diameters, height. We do briefly some fractal analysis uh, studies to check but not very promising. Uh, in order just at least to have some dimensions of uh, the length, the width, the diameters, and uh, relate with simulations. So this is the whole pipeline that uh, Andy, Andy Olivares around there is one of the, if not the most important person in the project, uh, together with uh, Guadalupe, a student of our master, just developing this um, pipeline for generating uh, finite element models out of these geometries. It took us a lot of time to get something more or less robust. We also tried mimics from Materialize, but we thought that with the current pipeline we have, it's a lot cheaper, all this is open source and free. And well, it takes a bit more time, but with faith and care and patience, you can get similar results. It involves, as you can say, uh, from the segmentation, just to generate surface, uh, meshes, some smoothing, some manual editing for the pulmonary veins, uh, mitral valve area determination, more uh, post-processing of the meshes until you reach uh, the, the final uh, 3D volume uh, mesh, and then running CFD simulations until now with uh, ANSYS, but also we are going to use ALIA from the BSC, etc., and the post-processing with Paraview. So, let me show you some real nice examples that Guadalupe generated uh, on some cases. This is what we have from the uh, rotational angiography images from Belgium. Uh, so segmentation is very basic uh, from region growing techniques, semi-automatic by uh, people in there. 
uh, then marching cubes, uh, and then we need to just play with mesh lab, etc., just to remove this feature that appears there. Uh, we need just to do some smoothing uh, for to run the simulations, and Tobin smoothing is good for volume preservation. Uh, we need to just determine the polymer events and the mitral valve also for the boundary conditions. Uh, what else? Um, and more whatever operations uh, just to, to just be able to put the boundary conditions and the pulmonary veins in there, just put these cylinders. Uh, and then the tetrahedral mesh. So we need in some cases post-processing of the mesh just to manually change and separate the atria from the left uh, atrial appendage, etc. But it's working. Uh, not sure how many cases we have already finished, but more than 10, 15, so, something like that. And obviously we have a lot of, we are starting to collect a lot of different parameters from the hemodynamic simulations. Also, we have kind of a very uh, ideal oval uh, atria where we have plugged a lot of different uh, appendages in order just to check the influence of just changing the appendage morphology. So this, will, this is quite useful just to be independent of the shape of the atria. Uh, so we have some boundary conditions that we have found in the literature in terms of pressures, velocities, and the mitral valve and the pulmonary veins. Uh, blood is modelized Newtonian, incompressible fluid, something more or less a standard. The mitral valve is treated as a wall at systole and then open at diastole. This is something we need to improve to have a more continuous, uh, the whole cycle thing. And these are some of the first initial uh, simulations. Here we have the left atrial appendage and some streamlines that no one can understand. But clinicians like a lot colorful things. So we showed to uh, this Tom de Potter and immediately he showed that to the people, the clinicians in Frankfurt. He didn't know anything about what it was, but he liked a lot the colors. So he showed and people, wow. So it was quite interesting. Um, these are more colorful pictures that uh, we are in the process of trying to understand. Uh, with the oval uh, atria, we can see in systole how it enters uh, there in the left atrial appendage, but not that much in, in diastole. This is kind of uh, the mitral valve, uh, trans mitral valve velocities around the whole area. Uh, so we are starting to get some of these parameters to, to analyze them. Some of the initial interesting results is that this is just uh, all the different uh, appendages plugged into the oval, um, to the oval atria. And I mean, the, the velocity profile look very similar independently of the, where, where is that? Independently of the left atrial appendage shape. So that's something that, well, okay. So for the mitral valve velocities, it looked like the, shape of the left atrial appendage is not important. Even we remove it, like it was an occlusion and it's around there. So it's, it doesn't look very important. Um, on the other hand, when you check the velocities within the left atrial appendage, there are differences between the different morphologies. That's clear. And we are now in the process of analyzing this. How we analyze? So typical measurements from the uh, hemodynamics looking at wall shear stresses, looking at, because in theory, low values of wall shear stresses related to low velocities, in theory, they are related to more risk of thromboformation, oscillatory shear index also, more related to the complexity of the flow. Is it, if it's more complex, it, it, it seems, or um, it should reflect more complex geometries and also more prone to have formation, resident times, and also one very interesting that we recently discovered from Humphreys and Alberto Figueroa, et cetera, on aortic aneurysms, is this endothelial cell activation potential where it combines the OSI uh, and the wall shear stress, meaning that if you have very complex patterns, a high OSI, and you have low velocities, low uh, wall shear stress, then you have more risk of thrombus formation. So that's quite interesting measure. So 
we are starting to have tables, uh, nightmarish tables like this one, full of parameters for uh, morphology, full of parameters of uh, hemodynamics, also uh, videos here like vorticity, um, and we are starting to suffer from big data sickness. We don't know what the hell to do with all this data um, very well. So we are really nowadays in the process of trying to make sense of all this. Uh, um, we also have with the real, the realistic geometries. This is just for uh, cases and we are starting, obviously, colorful and nice pictures uh, on vorticity, renal maps, streamlines, residence times, and, but obviously this is completely useless if we don't uh, try to quantify this and try to, to, to relate it to some clinical hypothesis. Uh, also, this is wall shear stress maps and, and the vorticity values. I mean, the initial thing is that they look okay. So, vorticities are created in the ostium of the left atrial appendage and not on the other parts of the left atria. With more complex geometries, you see more vortices, etc. higher values of stress. This is the values of the, this ECAP, this relation between the ostium and the wall stress. And you see that the red parts uh, below are the regions with higher a cup value, meaning more risk of thrombus formation, and it's logical that appear there and in this type of configuration. Also full of values for the realistic geometries, and this is just four cases. We have 40. So, well, we'll see what we do uh, with the rest. Um, so, yeah, some of the initial conclusions that we have until now is just that there are a lot of differences in volumes, left atrial volumes, uh, pulmonary vein orientation and shapes, uh, left atrial appendage volumes, landing zones, lengths, and number of lobes. Nobody has taken this into account to check for all these parameters influence on hemodynamics. Also, this mitral uh, valve velocity is independent of the shape is interesting. Also, uh, that using a single point measurement uh, to evaluate the complexity of a flow pattern is just stupid. Uh, they measure just at one point on the TE images and they say, okay, we have the emptying, uh, the stolic uh, blood flow, and that's all. It, it look, it's like in electrophysiology when you use the total activation time to characterize an electrical pattern. It's too simple. You need better than this. Uh, and other things like, yeah, I mean, the vortices are related, it looks, it are related with geometries with more lobes. And that this chicken wing uh, uh, cauliflowers is just too subjective, okay? It's not very useful. In terms of shape analysis, uh, when we look at this, I mean, we, we start to be a bit desperate. Because we don't, I mean, we are trying a lot of things and people like, smart people, like uh, mathematician people, like Costa, etc. And we, we are starting to, to play and we would like to have, to generate a space, a common reference space where you can compare these things. But it, it's not simple at all. Um, and, and to compute distances, uh, find similarities. We tried some spectral methods where we find some correspondences, etc. And whatever dirty word in maths Costa has tried, autodiffusion, heat diffusion, Laplace Beltrami coefficients, uh, whatever. We are playing, really. Uh, and we don't know what, we, we haven't found anything really useful yet. We have some uh, undergraduate students that we are slavering a bit, and, but they are so talented that in three months they are doing fantastic things. And we asked them a bit just to try. Um, yeah, I mean, just do cut models of, of these devices, find them on internet, on the patents or whatever, and they did it. And that's amazing, that's brilliant. Uh, and in fact, we are starting just to virtually implant these devices in some of the geometries and we'll start playing, playing around. Also some other students, they are starting to develop together with uh, Patricia, Garcia, a uh, LAM model of the whole cardiovascular system, including the left atrial appendage and in AF, not solved yet, 
but that will help to have more realistic boundary conditions to the fluid simulation. And future work, I mean, we have these all cases to, to process, to find a more rigorous way to, um, to characterize the shape of these appendages. One very important limitation we have now is that we treat the appendages as rigid, and this is not true at all. They can change up to 50% of their volume during the cardiac cycle. So we need to add uh, motion, the mitral valve displacement, FSI, etc. We'll start very soon with an undergraduate student on practicum, the 3D printing part, and in one year or two, start looking into models of thrombus formation. So this is uh, the gang of Compilao. A lot of people, really, really nice and really smart. Uh, and some of the uh, involuntary helpers, uh, students here. Uh, and obviously we are part of a bigger crowd that you know very well, the Barcelona Med Tech. And also I need to thank Blau for allowing me to finish this presentation. She was quite behaving. And that's all, thank you for your attention. So if you have any question. Thanks a lot for this great presentation. Um, very nice as always, entertaining as always. And I think what's also very important is that you keep on um, talking about the fact that this pipeline is really important. And when you do modeling and you say, okay, we're gonna model flow, it's not so that you just model flow. It's like, it's a whole pipeline. And also like maybe you can very, very briefly share your experiences, like how do you set up this pipeline? Because one of the things is obviously that you need to implement is going finding the tools and things like that. But also you need to get all these pe people engaged because you need to get your data somewhere instead of just using some kind of arbitrary uh, geometry. So how do you get on with this? Is this something that you say, I start my project and one week later you have a simulation or how should people try to approach this? It, it's, it, it's quite interesting because the modeling problem, the VPH problem, uh, the pipelines could have kind of similar faces. You could find similar faces, whatever you are talking about mechanical modeling or, uh, uh, or flow modeling or electrophysiology. But depending on the question and on the physical phenomena, you will have more problems with different of these steps. And in fact, in here, when you start working with flow, something that is quite uh, different from other physical phenomena is that you don't worry too much about the equation. It's Navier-Stokes, that's all. You, you don't need to go and invent whatever, just forget. I mean, it's just Navier-Stokes, you will use Navier-Stokes. And if you pay, or even um, you pay ANSYS or COMSOL or whatever, you run, it's a button. You, you can run it and that's all, you don't need to code. So you need to worry just, just on generating the meshes, and generating or have the appropriate boundary conditions. When, when you go for mechanical modeling of the heart, you really need to worry on the equations also and electrophysiology also. You have different models and you don't know what to use. But it doesn't mean that this is easy because as you were saying, it's the whole pipeline. And when you see the reduced amount of scientific works doing modeling on this particular application, I mean, there are some difficulties. And one is the, uh, well, just to have uh, uh, right uh, geometries and right models. A and the thing is, we had good uh, partners and good friends working for years and years on these cerebral aneurysms or other type of modeling problems where you can ask them and they will tell you perfectly, okay, try to use this measure try to use Gmesh or try to use MeshLab or, or Mesh Mixer because it will help you for manual editing, etc. But it's still nothing automatic. Huh? It involves always manual and painful uh, addition. Of, of. So you need just get the data from clinicians, have people with experience on modeling, both on the meshing side and running equations, etc. And then have some validation data and just try to put together everyone and everyone is interested. So networking is as impo important as the modeling itself. And maybe I cannot let you get away with it, obviously, since you mentioned the big data deluge, what about using machine learning? Uh, I, I tried to provoke a bit on this. <laughs> I mean, 
Yeah, well, what you would do here? So you put all this data, part simulated, part not simulated, not validated at all, bam, dim learning. <laughs> and what? <laughs> That's what I'm And it will say, yeah, this parameter is the most important. Well done. And now, yeah, maybe we'll, we'll end up doing it just for fun because it's not that difficult to do. And this is really the black box. Um, but we want to go a bit beyond that and try to understand why these parameters and which ones, in theory, they should be important or not. We'll probably huh, start using some uh, machine learning techniques to try to make a bit, to have help. I mean, machine learning is very good to have help and more insight on the data, and not just to treat it as a, as a black box. Other questions? Uh, thank you for the very interesting talk. Uh, functional mitral regurgitation is a huge unmet clinical need and expected to be a bigger problem than aortic stenosis. In your model, um, uh, how will you um, uh, introduce that as an outlet variable um, just to see the, the impact of that? Just because I think that might drive clinical change and we may Definitely. treat functional mitri mitral regurgitation if you can prove it has an impact on the stroke risk in left atrium. Uh, it would be super interesting, but I think we are a bit far from it. I mean, obviously, it will involve changing the boundary conditions at the mitral valve. And th there are some people we know that we've been working with, I mean, Philips, etc., working on mitral valve modeling. Uh, so one possibility would be try to couple our model with their models, uh, probably in a weak uh, way for starting, and try to use their output as boundary conditions input boundary conditions for our models. But I think we have a lot of problems to solve before going to have detailed uh, mitral valve situation, but for sure it will have an influence, I mean, obviously, because it will increase the, ha the pressures of the atria and so. Question there? Well, thanks, Olka, for the nice presentation. A um, couple of questions. Uh, which modality is used for, to, for um, the reconstruction of the of the atria this is x our is ET, uh, yes 3d rotational angiography okay and uh, how long does it take to process one case to have it ready to run segmentation is done i mean um, the machine is general electric is from general electric sorry um, they have tools uh, for doing uh, easily the segmentation and then i mean now we have run the pipeline for several cases. Andy, what, a couple of days? Huh? Just when you have, you have, yeah, you have your, your raw data, your image, and then you have, okay, uh, I'm ready to click the, the machine, uh, the volumetric mesh. Okay, and then, uh, um, could you comment on, on, on your results? You, I'm very curious why in the velocity at the entrance, when you have the same um, idealized atria and you have uh, at the entrance of the, of the appendage, you have the same velocity no matter the, the shape of the, of the appendage. Could you comment on that? I, I found no, no, at the mitral valve, not at the entrance of the left atrial appendage. Oh, okay. And that's something well, we need to to see why, um, why it looks like it's not, it looks that it doesn't change, oh. the mitral valve velocity profile. It At the entrance of the left atrial appendages, it will be different, for sure. Okay, okay. Because okay. you have different, uh, di different dimensions, different blood flow entering. I mean, we have the same, well, yeah, uh, pulmonary vein, um, boundary conditions, but the left, Actual appendage geometry is different, so there they are different. Okay, makes sense. And for, well, then maybe the answer for that is that the influence of the ap appendage is is uh, you can neglect that with respect to the whole hemodynamic in the in the cavity. Well, first thing is we need to check when we add movement, meaning more realistic. This is, is still valid because right now we could say okay, now we are modeling just the worst case F scenario of uh, persistent atrial fibrillation, so you don't have a lot of movement. 
it's an excuse to say that, hey, we have an added motion. But in this case of a severe atrial fibrillation, the atria is not going to move a lot. But we need to check if when we add a bit of motion, mitral valve ring, et cetera, is it still the same or not? Yeah. Um, I was curious to ask if, uh, apart from these um, subjective morphology descriptions, um, did you try to use the, the measurements of the flow that you are collecting to classify or propose a new classification of those uh, shapes? We are in the process of trying to understand them. Uh, or, or you you mean classify shapes based on their hemodynamics? Yes, and try to identify which is, for example, the most discriminative parameter. Yeah. And this is the idea of this joint analysis. What we want to try is just to analyze jointly mm -hmm. morpho and hemodynamics yeah. because we think it makes sense. Yeah. Can suggest to use random forest for this. Random forest. Which is not deep learning. And so you are. No, no, well, don't. Six. I mean, <laughs> we have a lot of people working for years and years, like Cecilia, with decision trees. Yeah. And any machine learning uh, kind of high hype. Machine learning will say, oh, decision tree is just too simple, whatever. But we believe that this is interpretable. So uh, we, we random force things like that, we like a lot also. Yeah. Um, sorry if I missed it, and I'm not a cardiovascular person, so it's a naive question maybe. Does everybody have one of these? Uh, L L a appendage, yes. Yes. Um, and do we know when it forms? Uh, is it something that happens? Yes. Um, I have some slides from the anatomies of Extremadura, and I try to understand them every time I see them again. But Bart can correct me. He is the expert on everything related to the heart. Um, embryo embryologically, it's a different structure from the left atria. In fact, it starts to being formed before the left atria itself. So it's kind of a remnant of the origins of the left atria. That's why you see that it's not a super smooth surface. It has pectinate muscles and it has some complexity within that is not in the left atria itself, that it develops later on. Right, Bart? Something like that. Okay. Um, and that's very interesting also, uh, that this remained there and uh, with different shapes on everyone. So the thing is, it's different, but it looks like it's okay. Everyone can live with different shapes. So it shouldn't be important, the shape, for normal functioning. But then, with abnormalities, it like thrombus, it looks like there is an importance there. So that's puzzling, that, that's interesting. Uh, just as a, and then I think again, I, it might be something I missed is, uh, so how do uh, clinicians decide when to put a device in? Is there something that's happened? Uh, uh, nowadays, it's when patients, they have contraindications to uh, anticoagulants because risk of bleeding. But obviously this is just a kind of a typha kingdom. Huh? Uh, if you're an expert of left atrial appendage devices, you want to implant whoever passes uh, in front of you. <laughs> so, and they are trying, this community, to get more important. And that means to eat some of the patients, the uh, atrial fibrillation patients, with risk of a stroke, but that they are not contraindicated to anticoagulants. And this is an interesting fight. Huh? I mean, they are proving, no, 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 we are as good as novel on oral anticoagulants. I mean, if they prove this, that would be quite massive for, for this community. Obviously, a lot of money. Um, yeah. Um, I wanted to ask if the left atrial appendix, does it have like trabeculation inside? Well, this is what I was saying. They have yeah. kind of pectinic muscles uh, yeah. that make kind of this kind of column Gaudi uh, structure. Uh, and it's not a smooth. But not in your models, you don't model this, or no? Not yet. Okay. I mean, you, the idea, the idea is on the post-mortem data we'll have from London and from Damian, either 
well, whatever, maybe synchrotron imaging or uh, micro CT to get some cases with highly detailed morphology, run some simulations, and do exactly what you are doing <laughs> with, <laughs> with the left ventricle uh, and see if we have find similar findings. Okay, thanks. Good, I think we can end here. So that also means that this is the end of the summer school with regard to the presentations. I want to rethank all of the speakers. I think as a program it was very, very interesting, very varied, very showing all the aspects that are important for modeling and for what we're doing. And so then I would like for you to come back at 2.30 when we will have the presentations of the hands-on and then also where the awards for the posters and the hands-on will be handed out. So enjoy your lunch. <laughs>